Here it is. Say hello to saltwater taffy. I don't know. I love this color. It's just like it's a color, colorful confection is what I, I describe it as. It's a, a colorful com confection of like, I'm just going to say peachy pink. I think if you look at it, it is a peachy pink. It just kind of captures the nostalgic amusement of, you know, like a boardwalk, uh, an oceanside, seaside boardwalk, saltwater taffy. Maybe you know what saltwater taffy is. Maybe you don't know what saltwater taffy is, but it is a very nostalgic candy. I think it's like from the 1800s and it comes in a bazillion different beautiful colors. And these colors of saltwater taffy are unique. If you've ever been into a candy shop where you see those big wooden barrels of saltwater taffy, I love all the colors because it's not it's not a true specific color, right? It's not a pink or a peach or a green or a blue. It's just kind of a mixture. And that's what you're gonna get here with saltwater taffy. It is a color that when you see it, you kind of wonder uh, how it's not been in there or uh, how it kind of fills in the, the gap, if you will, in, in this particular part of the palette. And I'm gonna go through where I think it fits in the world of distress. I'm gonna go through the swatches individually uh, and talk about it. But before I do, there is a backstory to this particular color, right? This particular color of saltwater taffy, there is a backstory. So let me share that right now. Um, and I even printed this out because I use my, I use my phone uh, for, for the video. So I did, I needed to print this out because, you know, I had to come, I had to come with receipts. I had to come with proof here. Um, so last year in March of last year, my good friend, Heidi Swap. Uh, who does amazing things with uh, Distress and does so much stamping with Distress Oxide. She messaged me, right? She was posting in her story, but then she messaged me this little photo. And I'll, I'll show you a close-up of this photo, okay? Uh, and this photo right here, it says, I think I can make this work. Two inks better than one. And she did this blend between spun sugar and abandoned coral just kind of circled like that sweet spot. And you know as makers, especially when it comes to uh, working with colors, that you know the, that's the beauty of distress, right? They, for those that want like a specific color, you have to get creative most of the time and, and figure out a blend, right? Because that's when you have so many colors in the line, that's what distress is about. It's about blending and mixing and being reactive with water. If you're just looking for a stamping ink, there are other inks out there that you can find, I'm sure, your dream color that you want. But this one in particular um, was this color. And it made me look, I was like, oh, you know, that's really, that's, that's a beautiful blend. That's what I replied. Oh, that's a beautiful blend. And it, it did, it intrigued me when I looked at the colors, because of course I get out the inks right away. Um, and I'm like, that is a beautiful blend because spun sugar is a wonderful pink and I knew we had kitsch flamingo. And abandoned coral is definitely more of an orangish reddish coral. So that just got things going. And I'm like, I'll send you some of the new color once I get lab samples if you want an early play. Now, remember, this is March of last year. <laughs> and I said, and thanks for the color suggestion. She said, you know, I would love it. And now fast forward, here we are. Uh, saltwater taffy is, is now part of the line. So about a year for this color, it was quite the challenging color uh, to do because I didn't want something that really looked like anything else. And it was very important to nail that, that in between that sweet spot, if you will, for where this, where this color fits in the line. All right. So let's, let's start with that because I do like to, to show you where it fits in the line. And then I'll go through each medium and talk specifically about uh, the swatches because like with many of the new additions in the distress line, uh, it changes. It changes depending on what medium it changes on uh, how you apply it, uh, paper, all of that. So let's just look in the world of pinks, if you will, because I know on, on different monitors and cameras and lighting, it, it could look very orange and peach, but I think if you see it lined up in the colors, it's, it might change things. So first let's just talk about pinks. In, in the pink world of distress, especially now that we add new colors, uh, certain areas of the palette kind of break out on their own. And this holds true, especially in the world of pinks and with the addition of saltwater taffy and with Kitsch Flamingo that we did last year. So spun sugar is always that wonderful, beautiful, soft pink, very clean pink. Then we had Kitsch, which is just that wonderful, uh, bright, but funky uh, pink color. I love that pink that it's much deeper than spun sugar. And then of course we jumped to picked raspberry. And of course somebody could argue and say, well, you know, we had, there's a, a lot of gap in between. There's going to be gaps in everything. If you, if you look at a Pantone book, uh, there's a, a bazillion colors that you could, 
that you could choose from. Mari, would you grab me the Pantone uh, deck out of that drawer, please? I'll just, maybe people don't even know what a Pantone book is. Just find one. It's going to be the first one on uh, closest to me on your left. Yeah, that one. Thanks. And I'll just talk about, so uh, if you don't know what Pantone book is, it's really how like the creative world works is in, in Pantones. And Pantones come in coated and uncoated, uh, depending on whether you're working on something shiny or matte. In the world of ink, we work on uncoated. Believe it or not, when Distress started, it didn't even start as a Pantone. I didn't even know what Pantone was when I started uh, choosing ink colors. I used to, like with the browns, I would find, you know, a, a piece of rusted metal or I would find, like in the case of weathered wood, right? Like a piece of weathered wood or peeled paint. It was this green paint. But then, of course, I became very familiar with Pantone. And Pantone, they have colors of the year that they predict uh, each year. They add new colors to this every year. So if you just think about, like, just in a pink, like, every little number shifts a Pantone, right? And there are, there are bazillion pages and a bazillion options for pinks and purples and blues. So when people say, you really need a this, yeah, you really need all of these. But the cool thing about distress or really with with inks once you understand colorants and dyes is how you can go in and you can mix and you can create your own combos and that was the inspiration with Heidi where she's like oh I found that sweet spot between this and this so in pinks we had uh, some very nice clean pinks but then we get into I'm just going to set this aside our new lineup of pinks right so tattered rose is a beautiful uh, pink color it's probably one of the first pinks that that I really started to work with. And, it, and I would have to argue that really when you look at it, it's not that much uh, of a pink, but it is a pink color. It's a dusty pink. So Tattered Rose. And then we had Worn Lipstick, which is a very nostalgic color to me. I love this color because it's just the color of lipstick that my, my grandma used to wear. And that is very nostalgic to me. And I love how it wicks out into colors. And one of the things I always show in swatches is not just the intensity of the color itself, but the wicking, because that is where the magic happens in distress. It is water reactive. And the wicking is what I look for in the color more than the base color itself. It's what are these tones that a color is going to achieve? That is what I want in distress, okay? And I know some people are just wanting to stamp with it. And that's why, you know, you may not have that perfect in-between color. You might say, you know, there's such a gap here. Right, but I'm, I'm getting stuff in the wicking. But when I looked at Abandoned Coral, even if it wicked out, it definitely wicked out with more of that orange coral color. And we didn't have anything in between. And you can see from the wicking that you couldn't achieve that color either, right? Just by adding water. You could, of course, mix the colors, which is what Heidi did by, you know, taking a little bit of, of this light color and adding a little bit of pink to it and then getting this. But this is where saltwater taffy really fits in well with the palette. It is a pinky color, but it does have peachy values, right? So I think depending on uh, what surface it goes on, that's going to be impacted. So I really love these colors. Now, of course, this is uh, the Distress Ink comparison, because when you get into Oxide, because it is a fusion of dye and pigment, you can completely change the values per se, because now it's not just going to be the intensity. Now we're going to have that that oxidation, that white pigment that is going to help lighten this color. And you could always combine inks and oxides if you're doing backgrounds, if you're doing blending. There was so many cool things that you could work with. But if you look at, say, spun sugar, right, it's much paler than the ink itself because we have that pigment in there that's going to oxidize. Same thing with Kitsch Flamingo and, of course, Pick Raspberry. And even these swatches, although it's direct to pad and it wicks out, this is a significant amount of water to get the wicking. This is still misted with water to get the oxidation. If you don't spray it with water and don't oxidize, then it will stay more true to its color. So there is uh, that variation as well. So then, of course, when you look at these, right, the oxides compared to the inks in this, again, you see quite the shift, right? You see that, that shift in tattered rose, saltwater taffy. Now it does, you, you start to see a little bit more of those coral kind of salmon uh, values in there because it does have more of that color value. I would describe it as like a light coral or salmon color, uh, but peachy pink is, you know, if people aren't familiar with uh, either one of those, a peachy pink is, is where that goes. And then, of course, worn lipstick. Now, this one changes significantly, but if you really look, 
the oxide is more of the wicking that you're going to get with distress. But if you compared it to its base color, it's like, whoa, it's completely different. But again, it's oxidized. If you don't spray it, you are going to get more of those pink values. And then, of course, abandoned coral. This is where when that water hits it, it looks way more orange coral than red coral in the dyes. Those are things that are really important to understand about what you can do with your inks, right? Get them out there, mix different colors, spray them with water, wick them, watercolor with them. That's where you can find those in-between values. Because again, when I went back to the Pantone book, there are a million possibilities for color. It's always fun. And that's really why I like the fact that Ranger allows me to add new colors, right? Because you, I mean, you could argue back there like, okay, well, we were good with 12 colors. We were good with 24. We were good at 36. We were good at 60. You could always add colors. We could add colors if Ranger would let me add colors as long as they wanted, but mm, that's really not going to be the case. Um, so let's just go through the swatches and I'll try to talk a little bit about uh, how saltwater taffy reacts on on the surface and the substrate. So I'm gonna just got my putty behind these guys. We just take these off. It keeps them from rolling a, a little bit, but I like to take those off. We have that. There we go. There we go. Okay. Okay. Yep. I don't mind putting a little putty on things. It's always the magic of videos, right? Anything that then we just use it again. Okay. We'll go in with these guys first. We'll talk about inks. Now the inks of course could be ink pads and or uh, re-inkers for either one, right? Whether you're gonna uh, stamp or blend with this, or maybe you just like to do re-inkers and do watercolor, right? You can do this. But let's start with uh, watercolor cardstock, and I'll show you the difference when you change papers. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be watercolor cardstock. However, if you are working on a paper that is designed to react and blend with water, you will get more of that reaction property of an ink, okay? Meaning if you try to take distress ink or uh, re-inker, and even if you do just a white cardstock, right? Maybe you're working on Nina cardstock and you're like, I love this cardstock and you try to get those layers, but you're not bringing up those values. It's the paper is not designed to do that. It might be great for blending or stamping, but not necessarily for water. So whenever I want a good uh, watercolor background, I'm either going to do watercolor or um, the white heavy stock, which is also designed to get wet and react with water. Here you're going to see in saltwater taffy, right? This is just smashing the ink on uh, the craft mat. Here you're going to see really how this changes, right? We're gonna get those really pale values. And as we build it up, it's going to, uh, I think kind of get into some pink values right, when it's light and get into those really rich corally kind of salmon values as well, right? This is just on watercolor cardstock. Now when you blend, well, you get a whole different gradation. This is where that softness comes out. This is where that beautiful uh, in-between peachy pink comes because we're using a blending tool and a blending tool, of course, is always going to uh, apply the lightest value of that color, the very lightest, no matter what. You just can't build this intensity that you would get with water uh, with a blending tool. You just couldn't. It's, it's never going to happen, but you can always apply more layers and you could certainly build up that color. And I love seeing that, that transition of color. Now, if you change paper, even with just the slightest undertone paper, right, going from white to this is mixed media, a little bit of cream, look at how that color changes. Now we're starting to get into uh, more of those peachy values. I think if you were to, to look at these, right, so now you can see pink and peach just by changing the paper. Now, if you didn't have that paper, what, what does that tell me? Well, that tells me that I can throw in some antique linen if I wanted to get in some more peach, or uh, I can even throw in a yellow like squeeze lemonade, although it's probably going to get a little bit electric. But just changing uh, to a cream paper will certainly change. And same thing, those undertones are going to be a much softer variation. But as you build levels, especially in a dye, dye is always going to be your most intense application of color dyes are what's going to permeate the paper and what's going to build up a uh, really rich color in there. Okay. So just looking at that from the ink pads, uh, beautiful. And those are both distress ink, right? Working on those substrates. But now when we switch to oxide, we're not going to get as much of a shift regardless of paper. So let me just kind of show you that. So this is again, watercolor cardstock, layering, smooshing, wetting, getting that great oxidation. I love how that oxidation brings up a little bit more of those pink values, but look at the blending. See, that's the other thing that you need to understand if you're new to the world of distress or ink blending. 
A dye is translucent, meaning we see through it. So when you blend on white paper with a dye, it is always going to look really light and faint. And a lot of people say, oh, my ink pad's dry because I'm trying to blend and I'm not seeing anything. Well, you're not supposed to. That's the idea of blending. It's supposed to provide the lightest application of color and you have to build. So the lighter the color, let's say you're trying to go in with, say, speckled egg, right? Or even spun sugar, right? We know spun sugar is a really pale, pale pink. Blending that with a blending tool, you would have to do so many layers to get any color to appear even on white because that's its, that's its purpose, that's its point. But when we get into oxide, because it is a dye and a pigment, you're still getting the vibrancy of a dye, but you're getting the opacity of a pigment. And that's why blending much, much easier because you're, get, you're laying down way more color uh, at, the same, at the same time because that dye and pigment is covering. But you can still control the intensity with a blending tool. Now, because it has dye and pigment, when we switch surfaces, so again, we're going from that white to mixed media, we see a little bit of that tone, especially where that color breaks and shows some of that paper through. But overall, they're pretty similar. They don't look as different, right? There's a subtle difference, but not nearly as different uh, as, a, as a dye, because again, that pigment is helping to cover up some of that foundation. But you will get a difference because we still have dye in here. It's not just pigment. If it was all pigment, you would have no shift because it would simply cover it. But the beauty of oxide is that we have a dye and a pigment. Again, I love how this oxidizes because we get this wonderful surprise of this light pink, this light coral color. Beautiful. Then we get into sprays. So spray stains, whether they're spray stain or oxide spray, in the world of saltwater taffy, it's no different, right? Because we're going to get the intensity of our spray stain and kind of that light subtlety of an oxide. So you can see how that stain, right? The more water you add, the lighter it's going to be. When you put it on mixed media, we can see a little bit more of the peachy values. Very important that you just kind of see that that shift, that subtle shift in this. But when we go into oxide, well, there again, we don't see as much of a shift even in a spray because this is just a, a fluid way to apply this, right? But we still get all of that great reaction because of the formulation. It's still gonna react with water. It's still gonna wick. It's still going to do all of those beautiful, beautiful blends that we love about Distress, okay? Then we get into paint. And now the cool thing about paint, if you haven't really used Distress paint before, uh, it is still a water reactive paint but once it dries, it becomes permanent. So great for art journaling, great for fabrics, great to put on wood or metal. If you simply just apply it direct to a surface. So this one, I just use my finger just to apply it. You can see I get nice coverage with that paint, but I also have the ability to kind of control it, okay? Control the coverage, but you can also use water to react it. So this is taking paint, putting it on a, a craft sheet, spraying with water, dip dry, dip dry, and we're getting this blend. The cool thing about this blend, this blend is completely permanent, waterproof. If I put collage medium over it, it's not going to wick, right? Gel medium, doing anything. So a lot of times people want to use distress or create a background that they know they're going to build on top of, okay? You can do that. You can do that with paint because once this dries, this medium is permanent. Now, you don't have as much play as you would with an ink, but you certainly can get all of those values by still using water and and as long as it's the paint is wet you can continue to thin this out but once it's dry it's going to be permanent now on mixed media paint well we're not going to see a different a change because again we're dealing with just solid pigment so that's why there is no change when you apply it direct what even though the paper changed paint is completely opaque there's no dye there's not going to be any difference but when we start adding water because we're creating those open areas, we do get a nice change, right? We get to see some of those more uh, peachy values of saltwater taffy over the pink values that we would get on white. Really fun. And this is, uh, honestly, this is my motivation, my goal about new colors, right? It's not just adding one specific color. It's what color can we bring in that's gonna be almost that chameleon color. We saw the same thing, well, with most of the distress colors, like right? we saw it with, uh, salvage patina, right? Where it looked blue on one paper, but it looked more green on the other. Same with speckled egg. Any of those kind of in between lighter colors, we get that shift. You don't, we didn't see it much with prize ribbon or villainous or, or rustic, um, crackling a little bit, but 
quite fun. So speaking of translucency, then we have the embossing glaze, which I know many of you uh, that got the, the latest colors really started to play with the fun, colorful uh, nature of embossing glaze. Now, because this is a translucent embossing powder, well, that substrate is totally going to shift, right? When you put embossing glazes just down with clear ink, right, you can see that your surface totally impacts that color. And this one you definitely notice from that more pinky value to more of the peachy value of saltwater taffy. It's just, it's a fun way to work with this. And because this is not, this is not a dye or a pigment, right? It has kind of, it's a, it's a color match, if you will, but it, it needs to be translucent. We need to be able to see through it. So that's why we don't build it up to the full intensity of a color. It's just kind of a, a shade or a tone of that. Really, really cool uh, to see how these colors play in to the mix. I absolutely love I just, I love this new color. And I think, you know, the fact that saltwater taffy has such, such cool properties when you see the makes, because I do have some makes to share with you, you'll see how this is used and how when you use it with other things, right? Whether that's going to be uh, papers or stamps or any of that, that's going to totally change, uh, I think, how that, how you'll see that color. So again, just from a quick overview, where do I see saltwater taffy? I still see it in that pink range because it definitely uh, falls between, say, tattered rose and worn lipstick. I think you notice it uh, more with anything on the dyes, right? As we go into true pinks and then we start going into more of these kind of corally pinks, which is really cool. So what do you guys think, right? Hey, everyone. So now I'm looking back. See, now that I like got the color out, now I can just like exhale and breathe. Hey, Kath. JT in the house. Hey, Joy. People, Thanks, you guys. People are Googling uh, saltwater taffy. Yes. And they're like, oh, there's not any salt involved. I don't understand. Is well, the, it taffy? Is it taffy? It is made with salt and water. Th that is in saltwater taffy. It's just not made with salt water. My friend, uh, my friend Rachel, who owns Darkroom Door in, in Australia, so shout out, Rachel. Uh, we were messaging because she always likes to guess the color. Uh, and then because she's a, a distributor there, when she got the color, she's like, so I, I don't understand what this <laughs> stuff is. Uh, it's... It's a taffy, like a chewy candy, but yes, it, it, if you Google it, then you'll hear the story about like how it got that nickname, uh, saltwater taffy. But yes, it is made with salt and water, just not salt water. But I liked it because it's that color that, well, it's not a peach and it's not a pink. It's a peachy pink and it's a coral, but I already had abandoned coral. So I needed to find something that had that kind of, to me, like that oceanside, seaside, beachy vibe that's what kind of led me down to this so it. yeah i think that's going to be the best so i see a lot of questions like will there be distressed crayons yes there always are distressed crayons but they don't follow uh until we get uh three new colors in there and i think we just launched color so i think there's another new color before uh, we get into a crayon in this uh, minis for this i think this now hit our fourth color for mini so usually minis are like usually about a month after the, the fourth color that goes into that set. So it's just, yeah, it's pretty cool. I absolutely love it. This Florida cow loves it. I, I think it's just, it's very, very fun. Yep, every three, thanks Zoe. Yeah, every three for crayons, every four for mini. Sometimes I even lose track. Uh, someone said, why no alcohol ink? Because uh, this is distress and distress is not uh, alcohol ink, but they're, I don't know, I don't even think, I can't even think of a color in, Maybe salmon. There is a salmon alcohol ink, or at least there was back in the day of Adirondack um, when we had that palette. But it's just a really fun thing. And I hopefully like this visual, you can kind of take it in because I know that camera monitors and phones and televisions, however you're seeing it, can really play around uh, with your eye. But that's why I think seeing it in the makes is also really important, which I'm going to share with you because seeing it used and seeing it next to blues and browns really um, plays around with with your eye. And that's what any color should do. It should just give you a new, fun, creative outlet. Nobody needs a new color. We don't need a color, but it's fun to, to have and want a new color. That's, that to me is kind of my favorite. So let's go through the makes and talk about that. I will say that this little guy, this pin, I'm very happy because it looks beautiful uh, on the pin board, but this was a tricky one because, you know, to try to get it, especially when we're dealing with a pin manufacturer, to get that perfect color, man, they nailed it on that pin for sure. All right, move this off to the side, move these off, we'll get into the make. So uh, shout out to my, my little making team that they're the ones that, you know, they don't, 
they don't know what the new color is before they they make with it right it's the, the same team so uh paula stacy sharon and zoe thank you again for just getting the color and embracing it and accepting it for for what it is because they they just commit because they're the new color makers and they started i think when we did speckled egg and i'm like if you're in this you have to commit to the whole run really? like that's what it is you don't get to to pick and choose and then of course you're going to see uh some makes out there i know that there's product in the hands of many makers all over so you'll be, you'll start seeing inspiration this weekend uh, and of course as the makers are posting we'll be sharing this as well so here's the first make this is uh from paula and i love of course that the makers all work with different mediums that's the other challenge that they have is they really try to incorporate the paints with the sprays with the glazes in their makes and i want to see different styles and the reason i have those uh, four specific makers for a new color paula is always going to do something relating to ideology or home decor stacy you're going to see uh, is is supposed to like tap into the shabby side of it using a lot of white which she does uh, then on the, the contrast of that, Zoe is supposed to only channel her inner uh, grunge goddess and, and use that with brown. And then, of course, Sharon is to try to uh, mix this with every color possible in the rainbow. And so they all have, not only do they have to work with the color, but in a very specific way, right? So this is the Ideology vignette display panel that Paula created. And here you can see saltwater taffy and how it works in even with all of the Ideology papers, right? These backdrops that we have in there. Uh, Paula used the paint on mixed media, created the stitch. Here she did some stamping, right, with oxide. And I, I love how she created these patterned papers that go in with the ideology backdrops and then did a very cool stitched collage, collage medium over this. Wonderful little deco frame from ideology, a little photo booth, it's her mom. And then uh, some, I love that photo. And then just doing some watercolor with distress ink in there. It's just really cool to see there's a little bit of, can you see that little leaf back there of the collage paper, right? My heart with that little gold. Just a, a great way to incorporate color. And that's the other thing to keep in mind as, as a maker, right? When a new color comes in, that's the whole idea of saying, all right, th this is great that I have a color, but let's look at some of the other things I have. Maybe it's scrapbook paper. Maybe it's another color of ink that you have uh, or something else that you wanted to incorporate. That's what's always important about anytime you add a new color, not just distress, even in your inks, it, you'd be amazed what you can pull out from some of the things that you have. So beautiful panel. Then when we get into cards, take a look at this beautiful card that Stacy created, right? There's that new doily 3D folder in the back. I love that. Isn't that crazy? I mean, that 3D folder, it looks like there's a doily like decoupage on this card, but that's the embossing folder. And I love just seeing uh, the floral outlines just embossed in a metallic and then going in, adding some light watercolor. There's that color on a little bit of crinkle ribbon. So here's where you start seeing, you know, as you add more water, because that's the thing about distress, that reaction with water, you can pull out different properties. When you build this up, you're going to build up more of that intense, uh, corally, peachy pink color. But when you watercolor it, it's gonna appear more pink in certain areas. Then when you start mixing it down on mixed media, it's gonna start showing a little peach. That's the beauty of saltwater taffy is that it's got that, that playfulness, that mix of, of color, right? Whether you're working with uh, a, an ink or an oxide in there and of course your substrate. So just beautiful card, right? Love the layers and just love the, the shabbiness of that. Just beautiful, very, very cool to see how everything always changes, right? So Sharon, I'm actually gonna take a couple of Sharon's at a time because Sharon just, she makes a lot of cards, but they're, they're always like different, different themes, different color values. So you're gonna see a lot of different things uh, that Sharon created. These are two of her cards. Here you can see, again, taking that new uh, plaid dye and I love seeing saltwater taffy on there, but look how well it pairs with blue and she just did some smudge stamping I love on the back where she talks about you know saltwater taffy broken china just how you can pair it with colors that you already have whether broken china might be a favorite mermaid lagoon tumbled glass maybe it's going to be salvage patina but this is what makes adding a new color fun because one new color is going to make so your old colors have completely uh, new life and new potential and and seeing it mixed with other colors right? Adding that 
little bit of saltwater taffy here, dusty concord, picked raspberry. I just, she has no fear of color. And I think her challenge is like, how many colors of distress can I, can I put the new color with? But you can see how it, it changes, right? This to me definitely has a coral vibe, but when I see it uh, with that picked raspberry and, and dusty concord, that purple, I definitely see more of the peachy tones. That's what I hope you enjoy about new colors in distress, not sitting there going, okay, well, he's already done a green. Oh, He's got two blues in there. We don't need another blue. It's not, it's not about what, what those 12 are going to make up. It's about what is this new color going to do to the full palette of Distress and how it can play in. And I absolutely, absolutely love those colors and how they work in. So then we'll talk about grunge. And I, I saw some comments uh, already. And yes, Zoe did Gladys. Uh, we saw Gladys a lot when uh, she launched in Kitsch Flamingo because, well, the makers didn't have uh, this color. Zoe had it, so she was making that. But I love seeing uh, Gladys in saltwater taffy, just the, the fun layers. There's a little oxide. Take a look at the glaze on there because remember that glaze is always going to give you a little bit more of an intense color, right? Layering that over the top. That little paintbrush is classic. I think that's from Crazy Things. I think from the Crazy Birds, that little brush. How fabulous is that? Some stamping on the background, again, with the glaze makes a great resist, but you can see that even if grunge is your jam, it's a beautiful color to grunge up, right? Because it's not going to muck out to abandoned coral because it has its own values and you can still get those pink values as well as some of those peachier values, even if you're using it with, with some grunge colors. I love that distressed paint on metal as well. So, I mean, that, that the thing, that's important before I even go into like more and more samples, just so you can see kind of the comparison stylistically in makes. The paper is win. <laughs> so fun, right? Yeah. But see, even just stylistically for a color, that's what I hope you guys always see when there's a new color. I know it's just, it's more the excitement of, you know, the guess or, or what it is, but really stylistically that color needs to fit in all realms from uh, grungy to shabby to vintage and to colorful. So let's keep going with the makes. Love it. Beautiful. Of course, when you switch substrates, that's the other thing that's going to be um, really important. When you switch substrates, that's going to switch colors. So here, I'm just going to slide this off. Paula created this little uh, accordion book. And I love all these other colors, you know, the little addition of salvage patina, when you add a little fossilized amber, this is what makes, I think, adding, adding to the palette so magical, right? So I love this tag book, that stitch. There's some of that, the ideology linen tape, but look at those colors and how you can just create some backgrounds. You don't have to fill everything in, just use some of your favorites and see how that pairs and mixes in. Then go in and do some stamping. Now, obviously when you do the glaze, remember the glaze, that's what's giving uh, more of those peachy vibes. But then if you're just going to stamp, that's what's going to give more of the pink vibe, right? So you can see just those different mediums on here. And I love how Paula incorporates this with ideology, whether it's the paper dolls. I love that the mini marquee, the worn wallpaper, just a little detail in clippings, just absolutely stunning to see a little story come to life. Some of the stickers, absolutely beautiful. There's some die, a little die cut in there, right? Focus on the good. Just, it's a, it's a cool way, I think, to, to utilize your inks, right? Sometimes we just think inks are all over backgrounds or that we're just going to do uh, stamping, but you can still take just tags do backgrounds. People say all the time, what do I do with tags? Well, yeah, it can be a card front. It can cut up. You can use it for, you know, any type of uh, collage or mixed media or just using this and pairing it together and then creating a little story. There's beauty and simplicity for sure. And I, I just absolutely love it. I think everything about this is so charming, but adding that color with salvage patina and that, that bit of yellow magic, right? Magic. Love it. Then we'll take a look at this little card set. So I, I was blown away like how many cards came. I put them in a little tin, Stacy. but I loved these cards. And I think most makers will agree that like once you, once you start on an idea, right? You get into that compartmental making, you can go in and just take an idea and just go for it, 
play around with all different things. So these little cards that Stacy created uh, use the, the mini 3D. That's gonna be that smaller scale 3D folder doing some inking on there, but look at that detail of embossing those papers and inking that folder to get that background and then taking some of the color and then just doing some watercolor and repetition, right? Once you have the idea, you can have that, that postage die from, uh, I think it's, this, it's not stacked tiles, but there is a layered postage that I did. You can do vellum, do a little embossing, do some background stamping, and you can switch up the colors, right? So this is if you wanted to do salt water on the background or you just take a green and throw that in this way, the, the pink is going to pop out a little bit more. I love this one with the damask, right? Just seeing that. So this isn't a mini scale, but you can still use part of an overall background and cut it up. So I'll just like grab another one where you just, you can take that design and do like parts and pieces of that, right? Cut it up and make it into two cards. So whether you're inking your folders, whether you're working, and Oxide is really great for that because it, it just gives you that beautiful smooth finish, but you can play around with different mediums. The point is that different colors that you're going to have are certainly going to impact uh, how saltwater taffy plays into uh, your world of distress or not, right? You may look at this and be like, dude, I do not need another color. I was coming here specifically for, I have no idea, but whatever it was, it, maybe that's not it. But I still think that seeing how these colors can work, that's what I love about the world of distress, the, the creative possibilities of what a color can do and how it can change the palette itself. I do, I, I agree. I love this combo of, because it is, it's definitely more, more pink and green. And I would imagine if this green was more like on the bundled sage side, that it might look, I don't know, maybe a little bit more peachy. Who's to say, right? Don't know. But I love how, how beautiful that, that color is. It's amazing uh, that we get all these different ideas and styles and the make, like we don't even have a conversation about it before. That to me is what, what always blows my mind is when I see this, I'm like, we didn't even talk about this. Everyone just kind of did their own thing and they brought up the best of a new color. So here are two cards that Sharon did. I think seeing it against black really changed for me, right? When I see it against black, I definitely notice more of that that peach quality. I'm not sure why that is. Uh, maybe it's because it, it's mixed with that purple and yellow, but that's really beautiful on a card. But also on this background, right? Of that new leather embossing folder, really cool, right? That quilted one. But I still, I see definitely more of that salmon color. So I don't really see it so much as peach, but I also don't see it uh, fully with pink, but great way to incorporate die cuts. So when you're looking for ideas of even how to incorporate a color and you're like, I don't like to blend, I don't like to do all that wet drippy nonsense. Okay, but you can still take one of those mediums and paint that paper or ink that paper and use your favorite die cuts or punches. And that's a great way to incorporate color in, in your work. Isn't that beautiful? Love that, the ideology, little label sticker. Just great, great card, Sharon. They're just, they're fun. I, I love this, no fear of color, but also, as I mentioned, each idea, totally different. And they just knocked it out of the park because they get the new color. I'm like, just make whatever you're inspired to do. I mean, think about that. You know, in, in the world of say, Sizzix or Stampers or Ideology, they're getting product with a design that they create with. Here, it's just a color. So it's like, you know, sky's the limit when it comes to imagination and, and what you wanna create with it. So Zoe created this. I love seeing this. This is an old school die, right? This vintage valise. But I thought, what a charming little way to use this die. She put a little journal in here, right? Where she incorporated that plaid stamp. This is from Stampers Anonymous. And there's no doubt that she went in. I, I just, I do not have a steady hand. And painted in, you guys see that? That saltwater taffy. Just painted in there on that plaid and then layered with this stamp set of all those travel layers the travel labels. Here you can see the, the glaze. Look at that. Embossing glaze on the front really pops that out. But see that glaze it looks a little bit more peachy, but I love it with the brown. But then when it's watercolored with oxide, it looks more pinky. That's the beauty of, of this color, saltwater taffy. Very, very cool to, to just go in and incorporate that. Look at the inside. All lined with that color. Very clever make that old school that when I saw this at tomorrow, I'm like, Oh my gosh, I remember this die. Cause it was like the, I think the first time I ever designed such a massive steel rule die before, uh, just very, very clever make with that color and paired with Brown, right? Super cool. 
All right, we're just going to keep going in there. I mean, there's so many ideas. I think uh, next one, I think I'm going to jump back to Shran because I want to show these in, in particular. I'll do these guys, right? Because these, these were super surprising uh, to me when, when Shran created this because I actually had to, to read that because I didn't understand it. Honestly, I was looking and I thought, I don't really get this. Like, where is the color? Because I didn't recognize that. And then I saw like, well, hold on. She used the glaze, but man, that glaze color to me completely changed how I saw it, depending on what it was paired with and where it was. So these backgrounds, and it's ironic because it, it's done with a, a stamp that I use, and I'll show you the swatch stamp when we talk about stamping in a minute, but it's one of my favorite stamps. So uh, very cool background to use with the glaze, Sharon on these cards. So using this background, just working with your embossing glazes, pairing it with a black and white image, but you can see how that glaze just, it shifts, right? Sometimes it just looks a little bit more orange. And, that, and the thing about glaze that you can also keep in mind because it's translucent, you don't always have to stamp in something clear, right? If you have an ink, let's say you wanted to emboss with uh, archival, or maybe you wanted to emboss with distress ink. You have to work really quick if you're going to uh, embossed with distressing, but if you stamped in a color and then you put that glaze on top, you would also get that glaze to shift. So not just about like where you put it or what you pair it with, but also the colors that uh, essentially uh, you pair it with or put underneath it, right? And this set is just it's fun. One of my favorites, brush strokes. I wasn't going to talk about it till I did uh, the stamping ones, but if you're ever looking for something that's a, a great way, like maybe you're not good with a brush, right? Have you ever tried to just like, oh, I'm just going to do a cool brush stroke, but then you spend two hours getting the perfect brush stroke. Yeah, that would be me. Uh, th there are stamps for that, right? Where you could, where you do this with, uh, with embossing ink or even distress ink and you can wet it out or do watercolor, right? That's a great cheat is that you can ink this up, spray it with water and then stamp it and let it dry. And it looks like you just watercolored the perfect little uh, wispy circle or mark. So that's a fun set. But cool to see it on these cards, Sharon. Um, and, and I love, again, the color combinations that you put in there. Nice. Okay. So seeing, again, the colors mixed with different things. This is another project that Paula made. Because there's so much white on this one, you really start to see more of the pink values. At least I do of saltwater taffy. And seeing just like those hand painted stripes or again doing watercolor, that's the same uh, image that Stacy used, but this is embossed in white, right? So instead of embossing in that gold, which maybe brought out a little bit more of the peach value of saltwater taffy, that white really kept this uh, a nice pale vintage. There's a little bit of blue, maybe some speckled egg kind of watercolored back there, right? You see that? Embossing is a great way to provide outline and it doesn't always have to be an outline if that makes sense. Like sometimes people think like when I stamp, I want to see that image, you know, I want to stamp it in black. Absolutely. You certainly can or gold or any other, any other color you want to emboss with. But for subtlety, white is still going to outline a watercolor. It, it provides a great bridge, especially if you are using your embossing powders and you're melting them, right? It's going to provide a nice well for that color, but you can still visibly see the image without seeing the image, if that makes sense. And then I just love all the little details of ideology. There is a very soft, subtle, vintage perfection to Paula's work, right? Adding that photo, little baseboard lace frames, a little grunge, love the little tiny clips, some clippings, a little bit of lace, again, some layers, and then just added on, on a framed panel. So yeah, I miss these guys. I love these things. They're just, they're so cool. A beautiful make, but again, totally different color that I'm seeing uh, from, from Saltwater, right? And then this make from Stacy, same thing. I saw something completely different. I, I didn't even think of Saltwater as, as ever fitting into anything Christmassy. Now, not that this is a traditional Christmas make, but this little ornament die that I did with Sizzix has, has that Christmas vibe for sure. But I love the details of this uh, and that little denim kind of chambray around the edge of this vignette box is just a vignette box that's put on there. There's a little uh, curio knob, but by adding that blue, wow, it really changed the, the softness of this color, the shabbiness of this color, if you will. You can see some of the paint, some of the ink, there's some glaze on this photo, but I love how it's mixed with that blue and the stitching detail of the dies and the cutouts and the little buttons, right? So charming. 
So seeing this made me think like, okay, well, for the holidays, uh, this is actually a really beautiful color to put in because yeah, it's not a pink, but it's also not an orange. It, it really fits in well for uh, that wintry, beautiful uh, Christmas vibe. I love that. I love the little she was wishing. Cute, isn't it? But very different, like especially when you see them uh, side by side, like what I see in there. This, this I see uh, more pink. This I see now more coral. But when I only had this, it was more pink, right? Crazy. Ugh, colors. Colors are fun. And seeing what people do with colors and the details that they can bring out with things in a color, that is always just the, the best part of doing a new color debut. Besides the excitement and anticipation of a color, it's seeing how that color is brought to life in the eyes of the makers. Wow, 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 wow. And I can't wait to see what I haven't seen yet, right? That's the, that's the whole other part. Like what haven't I seen out there yet? So from a grunge perspective, even if that color, right, even if saltwater taffy or any other color, blue or anything, is you don't like to work in color, you like to work specifically in neutrals or vintage or, or grunge, adding a splash of a color, right? So you can see the background of this, and I, I love the, the effect, that torn, tattered, look at, look at the texture on that background. Isn't that great? That embossed with that, the gear back there. But seeing that little splash of this color, right, especially with all that yellow and brown, it doesn't read pink or peach to me. It reads perfection because it's also not, it's also not white. What I love about using a, a color like that, and again, this, this plays in with many colors in the Distress palette, whether it's a, a green tone or a pink tone or a peach tone, throwing that on as an oxide, right, splashing it on, right, the, the oxide spray or just wetting, wetting down your ink pad and, and splashing it on what you pair it with is, is still going to give uh, some warmth or a tone to your make. It's not just going to be that color. So even if you work in neutrals, don't be afraid to throw in and just try to add a splash of, of color, especially in an oxide, because you're still gonna get that great oxidation, but it is gonna pull up some value uh, of that color. And then it, I love how it's just paired with that little touch of pink, right? That little bit of craft stock, just a very cool card. Really, really cool. Love how makers use focus on the good too. I think Paula used that in her book. It was great, right? So speaking of, of seeing colors in, in a grungy way, Sharon created this card as well. And, and pairing it with a lot of different colors, I just think that, let's see, spray stain, salt water, scattered straw, tumble glass, which I'll talk about scattered straw, uh, and shabby shutters, again, very underused colors, and tumble glass. These are all very light colors, pale colors, but see, how they just, they jive together so well on that background, right? Absolutely beautiful. And that, that introduction of saltwater taffy just kind of as you, as you go around, saltwater into scattered, right? Into shabby, into tumbled, beautiful. Little bit of vintage, but definitely a pop of color. So Sharon like this, on a brown background, it's nice. I'm sure like she just, just kind of stepped up to the little, grunge line and then step back but left her mark of color and of course that that sanded metallic mm -mm -mm. so beautiful right so beautiful oh, perfect. i kind of want to keep that card yeah it's like i kind of want to keep that card and then we just we just start seeing shifts like just back and forth back and forth so an idea that i always think is great for makers when you're making and, and i talk about this a, a lot if you're gonna play with color, just sit down and play with color, right? Maybe you're going to ink like this. This is mummy cloth from Halloween. Such, it makes such a great trim all the time, right? Because just think of it as like cheesecloth. It's really beautiful to hold color. Uh, it only comes out at Halloween, but wonderful to, to dye and add that color, that little softness to this. But on these, these tags, taking a background, this is the, the crack leather cardstock, adding a little bit of that salt water, and then just, you know, maybe, made a couple hearts. Now you've got those hearts just sitting, sitting on the side and then you can create backgrounds, but using them in a different way gives that paper embellishment a totally different touch or finish. So first one we'll talk about like on this tag, I love seeing that glaze as a resist, right? And then just that little heart on there and I notice the big collage. I love the, the boldness of the black, right? Really cool on that. Love the background that it's got some some tones of gray in there as well, little splashes of 
brown just to add that rust charm. But then seeing the bigger one on a completely different type of background, right? A little crackle paste in, in the back, paired with one of the, the moths, the little label that's been stamped. There's beauty and simplicity, little hardware heads. Gives a completely different look to that same embellishment, right? This one becomes a focal point, right? Build off of that. And I think, Zoe, these are just, it's a very cool way to show how you can certainly sit and create something like this from start to finish, but all those pieces that you do throughout the making year, right? Maybe you're in the mood to just work with paste, or maybe you just want to stamp a bunch of little tags and labels. I've been seeing that on Instagram a lot where people are, you know, just stamping tags or stamping labels, stamping tickets, and you haven't done anything with it. And some people dismiss that concept altogether. And I think you're really missing the mark of the, the flexibility of being a maker. Because if you had all these ready, when you go to do a tag, you're like, oh, I have this die cut piece done. Oh, this was the day I just felt like stamping a bazillion moths and color and cutting out. I had no, no use for them. Oh, look, now I can stick that there. Oh, there's that label. Oh, I just add a little embellishment, done. Now you can assemble a make really in, in no time flat, but maybe that's not your style. Maybe you like to start with the blank canvas and build up, but seeing saltwater taffy on the grunge dirty side, See, that's proof right there that you can either bring out some more of the, the pinky values or the peachy values, depending on how, how dark and grungy that background becomes. Isn't that great? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then we'll go into uh, these cards from Sharon, these last ones. So this first one, right? I love just, again, seeing the different color combos, right? When I'm like, oh, look at it, you know, paired with Age Mahogany, right? So this one, this is another one because I see a lot of requests going, I want a burgundy, I want a Merlot, I want a wine color, I want, that's this. That's gonna be this infinity. Because depending on how dark or deep you put this, this could be as burgundy as you want it to be. When you start wetting it out, you're gonna get all these other values of every different type of red wine you could think of out there to name. And just adding a little bit of, of purple to this is going to make it a little bit brighter uh, on the mob side. So this is one of those colors that if you used it, in different ways, and again, I'll talk about that near the end, about different ways we can use Distress, you'll be amazed how many values a specific color you might already own has, which is why I, I'm not going in that direction, because you could achieve it with that. Often the darker colors are what allow you to achieve lighter colors. But going in with like this, this blue-green, so beautiful, and then pop with that red. See, now I look at this, I'm like, I don't know what I see. I see a little bit of uh, peachy pink coral, but I also see some light pink values. But then when I compare it, I'm like, oh no, it's definitely peach compared to this. That's what I love. Color fools the eye. And then of course, you're on just like, oh yeah, here, watch this. Look at that. All these colors together. Mm. This just, this made me smile to see how well it, it plays in, especially when you're working with this. And it's like all paints right? Because as I mentioned about the benefit of paint, and look at some of those crazy colors in here, right? Fired brick, evergreen bough, squeezed lemonade, seedless preserves. Paint, because it is water reactive, is still going to allow you to create all that wonderful fluid movement. But because it's the only distressed medium that is permanent when dry, you can wet out some colors, let it dry for a minute, use a heat tool. And then when you put another watercolor on top, like blue, it's not gonna to turn to mud, right? Or yellow, it's not gonna to turn to mud. As long as that other layer is dry, it will not re-wet, but it's still going to allow you to add wet layers. And that's the cool thing about distress paint that I think a lot of people always forgot. They looked at this, they're like, oh, that's just expensive craft paint. I could go, you know, I could go and get this for 49 cents or whatever, probably not now, but you know what I mean when it comes to paint, but having that water reactive value, getting that color to truly wick and layer and create either opaque intensity by putting it full on or letting that wick and either, either creating blends or letting it dry. That's the magic of distress, the water reactiveness of distress. Just beautiful. Yeah. When I saw this, I'm like, I, I would just want this printed as, I don't know, background paper or wallpaper. Like who knows? There's just, there's so many cool ways just seeing how a color can truly come together, right? From, from all sorts of different, uh, values that you might have to, I don't know, all sorts of cool different aesthetics. There's a bazillion ways and that's the, the inspiration of, of the make. So again, thank you to, to the makers that make for new color, to, 
to Paula and Stacy and Zoe and Sharon for creating these. And again, uh, this has gone out to the other makers. There's a lot of other makers out there that are going to make after live. A lot of it has to do with logistics. A lot of it has to do with uh, keeping the color uh, a surprise, right? A secret if we can. That's the, the whole point of that. But I, I do hope you love the look of, of saltwater taffy because to me, it's really, really cool. So JT in the house. It's good to see him, right, Mario? Looking out for the comment. Hey, JT. Uh, he did. That's awesome. Uh, so when it comes to the color, right, I'm just going to bring in these mediums and then I'm just going to talk about distress color, right? Just in general, just distress because maybe uh, you've worked with distress for a, a bazillion years like I have and maybe you haven't. Maybe you're new to it. But I think there's something to be said about understanding uh, the principles of distress and what makes it what it's supposed to be like what makes it do what it does okay uh, so when i look at these colors it's also important to know about the inks right that there's two different types of of distress now for each color right when we look at the ink pads so that we have ink and oxide in each one and that's why when it comes to the comparisons i like to show you a comparison it doesn't mean you only can work in distress ink or you can only work in oxide. You can certainly mix these two mediums on a background. You can wet them, you can uh, stamp them, blend them, layer them. But understanding what an ink can do hopefully will also help you understand a color. So um, I'm probably gonna crush a few dreams in just a second, but I'm gonna say it anyway because I, I'm, I don't wanna be uh, a tease about anything when it comes to new color. I'm certainly not just gonna go out and tell you what all the new colors are, but I've said it before and that is when I set out to do the new colors initially, uh, we were going to launch them within, I think the first total, uh, maybe calendar year or two years complete. But then of course, with the pandemic and uh, all the logistic issues, we started to really spread out the release. And now I'm just not in any hurry at all. Now it's just the new color will come when the new color is ready to, to go, right? But different ways of applying a color is going to be important. And that's why I'll, I'll get to the, the, the next thing in just a second. But when you apply an ink direct to surface and you wet it, you're gonna get certain values in that color, right? That's gonna be ink or oxide. And when you wet an oxide, you're going to get a different value of an oxide because water will oxidize distress oxide. But you don't always have to add water to either one, right? You can just, blend, stamp, apply to the surface and leave it alone. But water is what's going to make distress magical. Water is the reason that I wanted to create distress. Distress was created to be a water reactive ink. That's it, right? When distress came out, it was only distress ink. It wasn't oxide and paint and glaze and stains. It was just an ink pad that was designed to be water reactive because this right here is something I did not see in the marketplace. I saw inks that, yeah, you could get them wet and they'll run a little bit, but they don't wick. They don't explode into uh, beautiful colors. They just simply water down. Distress does not. Distress is designed to wick and build more intensity with water. So sometimes I create just swatches just with water, but it's super important to understand stamping. That just seeing a color stamped out is going to change how you see that color compared to smushing it down and adding water to it. You're going to, you're going to get a true value of that color if you just stamp it and do nothing else to it, right? Because you're only applying a certain amount of color to that stamp. It's only a certain amount transferring to the paper. And we're talking a single stamp, no cheating. Cause if you, if you stamp that image three or four times, well, you are building the intensity of the color. So sometimes if you just want to look at your colors and go, okay, you know, what do I see here? Take a stamp. In this case, I took this stamp. No, it wasn't this one. I think it was a skinnier one. Yep, put it on a block. And these I just stamped with oxide because uh, Distress was never designed to be uh, a stamping ink per se, right? Especially just these Distress inks. You can stamp with them, but they, they like to beat up on a stamp and there are tricks around it by, you know, uh, trying to prime your stamp and all of that. But if you want a nice stamping uh, ink in the world of Distress, there is archival. But there's also oxide. Oxide is an amazing stamping ink. And I know many makers have realized that. I think that's what even got Heidi Swap to just absolutely fall in love with these because whether you're using clear stamps or rubber stamps, 
oxide because of that dye and pigment. Sits on the stamp great, stamps nice and crisp. It doesn't stamp all smudgy like a, just a, a standard pigment ink does. And it gives you some really great color values. And so that's what this is. These are just stamped in oxide. But here now you can see those colors, spun sugar, kitsch flamingo, picked raspberry. Now we have tattered rose, saltwater taffy, right? Now worn lipstick, you see it and you're like, okay, wow. Because before when I looked at worn lipstick, it was like totally, just a completely different color. Yeah, well, it still falls in. It's, it's definitely much dirtier than these pinks up here. But now we have this whole new realm of these peachy pinks, uh, even going into the most intense that is abandoned coral, right? And because of that, this is, this is where it's going to be the dream crusher. So, and I hope I'm not here to crush any dreams, but I'm just here because I know that every single time that we do a new color, and this has happened even since last year, people go, I think it's going to be a yellow. And I'm here to tell you that there are no plans for me to do another yellow in the world of distress. There just isn't. And I'm sorry for that. And I'm sure there's going to be a million people sharing their best argument as to why. But I just wanted to be honest because I don't want anyone to, I just, if there's a color that's definitely not going to happen, then I just think I need to say it. Um, but, but there's reason behind that, right? There is reason behind yellows. Yellows are, yeah, I can go back to the Pantone book and talk about all the different shades of yellows. But that's because they want a nice yellow. But for the most part, when it comes to, How about a good yellow? when it comes to yellows, you know, there's just a, if you look in the entire Pantone book, there's just a, a few little pages devoted to yellow. And even on those pages, there's just a little bit of that yellow up here before it's mixed with other things, right? Whether it gets into green or browns or beige, there's not a ton to play with in yellow. And that's what I need to kind of share with you about maybe what you might be missing in these yellows, okay? And again, and I understand this is up for, you know, where people are gonna have different opinions, but I, I also want to talk about what you can achieve from these and why I did these specific yellow tones in the, in the distress line. We're gonna start with Squeeze Lemonade. Squeeze Lemonade, right? This is a, a clean yellow, okay? Meaning it is a bright, vibrant, true yellow, if you will. People talk about true yellow or clean yellow. That's really what Squeeze Lemonade is. When it hits water, it's going to go as light as say, a lemon chiffon that people have talked about. Like he needs to do a, a chiffon. Yes, there could be that light yellow, but when you build up that yellow, you're also getting a true bright yellow. Yellow is also the easiest color to mix together to change the values of it, okay? So the next yellow color, and honestly, the first yellow color I did in Distress is Mustard Seed. To me, that is like, that is my go-to uh, yellow because, well, it's, it's mustard yellow. To me, I see that as true, but it's also a dirtier yellow, right? You can see when you start building up Mustard Seed, it does have some dirty values in it because it is distress and I like that color to have a little bit more grunge. But it is nice to see that when you're when you're layering this, you can either get those deeper values of mustard seed or you can get those brighter values. But compared to Squeeze Lemonade, now you can notice how, how dirty, how different that is uh, in the colors. Then we went even one step dirtier, almost like an ochre color. Uh, with fossilized amber. So fossilized amber, we went even dirtier in the yellow tones, but you can see in the wicking, this part, what Distress was meant to do, was meant to wick and blend. This is what I'm looking for when I'm uh, designing a color, right? It's important to see the actual color of its stamp, but I wanna see what values is this formulation of color bringing out, right? And that means I can expect to see this if I blend it, Right? So even though these are water, these light values, that's what it's going to blend out to be like. It is going to blend in these lighter values. It's going to stamp in the darker values. And when you add water, you get everything in between. That's the, the joy of that. But these again are what I would consider more, more yellow, like true yellows that we played around with from a clean yellow to a little dirty yellow to a little bit of uh, a dirtier or amber yellow. But then there's also kind of that, that calming, smooth yellow, that that beige, that straw color, and that would be scattered straw. And sometimes people don't realize the, the creaminess, the beauty of scattered straw, because yes, it's got some great yellow values to it for sure. But when it blends or when you uh, water this out, this is not as beigey or dingy as antique linen, 
this is a yellow. It is that cream. It is that custard. It is uh, all those other uh, words that I see people describing that they want this type of, of yellow in particular, that's going to be scattered straw, right? Now, of course, if you used it direct, you are going to get more of that intense uh, straw yellow. But if you're blending, if you're watercoloring, if you're doing that, you get this really wonderful, very, very calming yellow. And then there's a weird one. Then there's wild honey. And I talk about wild honey a lot because wild honey, remember I, I just mentioned like saltwater taffy and uh, salvage patina, how it's that chameleon color, right? Depending on where it is. That's what wild honey is to yellows. It is that chameleon color. It is that color that sometimes it's going to be very yellow, depending on how much water you add, how many layers. Other times it's going to be more orange, right? Kind of like honey. Sometimes, you know, when you see honey, sometimes it looks more yellow. Sometimes it's more orange. Sometimes it's richer. And that is the whole idea behind wild honey. It's not quite an orange and it's not quite a yellow. It's friends with everybody. And that's why so many people, when they're doing backgrounds, they love wild honey because when you put it into a background, those tones will play with what you put it with, right? Whether that's a blue or whether that's a pink or whether that's a red, uh, that's what wild honey is going to do. And so I just felt that if I kind of just explained maybe the possibilities of distress, maybe you haven't played around with your colors. I'm not gonna say this is gonna change uh, people from, from being unhappy that there's not another yellow coming, but this would be my reasoning because I can still get a nice, true, uh, bright, sunshine yellow and if i want to make it a little darker i could add just a touch of mustard seed to do that or if i just like that nice mustard color i could use it but if i wanted to layer it i could get it a little bit dirtier then if i wanted to go full-on intensity and like this one this is the one that paula used in her book she chose fossilized amber because sometimes these are just actually true true yellow true true yellow and when you put that with colors maybe it's just too bright or vibrant and that's where fossilized comes in it's still going to wick out into those wonderful undertones, but it could get a little dirty if you go direct. And then we've got that straw and then we have wild honey. So that is why um, in, in my world of distress, I have no plans to do uh, another yellow. So I just wanted to tell you, so I didn't but people are, just, just wanted you to understand there's a reason. Happy about your yellows, that they're not okay. feeling that you need another yellow. Okay.